Hey, it's Rod Yates. Welcome to Mastering Events, an Audience Republic podcast. Each episode, I'll be talking to some of the world's most accomplished event professionals to discover how they got where they are today, the lessons they've learned throughout that journey, and their insights around event marketing and maximizing ticket sales. My guest today is Morgan Margolis, CEO of Knitting Factory Entertainment. The very first Knitting Factory opened in New York in 1987, but since then the company's operations have expanded far and wide, and it now owns and manages venues ranging from small clubs to outdoor amphitheaters, as well as producing events and festivals such as Desert Days Festival. Knitting Factory is also involved in touring and artist management, and via partisan records, music production and distribution of artists like Fontaine's DC and PJ Harvey. Morgan oversees it all, and as he explains in this interview, he pretty much learned on the job. His career could have gone in a few different directions. His parents were both actors, and his dad Mark found fame acting in films such as Scarface and on TV shows like Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, where he played one of my favourite screen villains, Hector Salamanca. Eventually though, Morgan settled on a career in events, venues and hospitality. Before we get into it, I just wanted to point out that I spoke with Morgan in December 2023, so when he makes reference to next year, he's talking about 2024. Without further ado, here's Morgan Margolis. Obviously, entertainment and art has been played a big part in your life. What are some of your earliest memories of being exposed to it, whether it's music or whether it was, you know, acting through your father's career? What are some of those early memories? My earliest remember, even though I'm born in the 60s, is really the 70s, you know, because I was, um, my parents were traveling actors at that point with a theater company. So I was, when I was little, I was involved with them as they had bizarre theater spaces in, you know, in the Bowery in New York City, a theater space called Blue Dome, which I used to run around in diapers and that. And then they had Birdcliff and Woodstock where... They had a theater company and, uh, you know, you would have people wandering onto the property like Bob Dylan. Like, I don't remember (laughs) that. I'm just told that uh, that was going on. My father used to sell him like weird screens and and colored lighting stuff for his shows. And then I traveled around the country with my parents in a van as they did this show called Conquest of Mexico. I remember that. And they used to go to different college campuses across America and got arrested in some. I mean, I was really part of this like hippie culture thing, which I only, I have, you know, vague recollection of those pieces. As I got older, I got more immersed into, they started to pull back in that world. But my world really wasn't so involved in music until later in life. It was more theater arts, although their friends were all in both music and theater and film and tell much more music, and much more theater than film and television it wasn't such a big thing then, you know, for them. What was it inevitable? I mean, I, I appreciate that as you got older, you actually studied law for a little while. But do you think, was it always inevitable that you would come back to, to entertainment? Because I, I, I realized that you also studied the high school of performing arts. Do you think that with that background, it was always going to be an entertainment slash arts career for you? I always thought it was going to be not that. <laughs> you know, so, so it was um, inevitable. I mean, look, I was, my mom's an actress father and actor. I was around it that I really think I would end up in it. I mean, I I honestly went to performing arts because it was my fallback because at the time I was in junior high school or here was junior high school then, um, I was doing shit that you shouldn't be doing, you know, and I was not doing well in school. But my overall goal really was to play football. I mean, I was an athlete and I was I was uh, even though I was up to no good, I was still playing football and I would play city league football and I had been playing tackle football since I was a little kid. And that was my dream was to play football. And when I didn't get into the, you know, the Bronx Sciences and the Brooklyn Techs and the Stuyvesants of the world or, or a school that was sports oriented, I was, and I, by the way, I had, let me back up a little bit. I had been playing the trombone also. So I was also, when I first auditioned for music and art, I did that side by side. It was for the trombone. I wasn't even thinking about acting. Again, we're going right. way back. And I didn't get in. And I was like, ah, damn, I got to. And then I was like, well, shit, I might as well (laughs) give this acting thing. So I picked up two monologues and uh, I worked with my dad and my mom on the monologues. I auditioned and I felt pretty good about the auditions. I mean, it must be, I mean, again, I was around it forever. 
and they worked me very hard on these. And when I got the letter that I got in, you know, you know, 70 kids of, of, of thousands, I was, I was blown away. But it saved my life in a way. I don't know if it saved my life life, but it sort of got me out of the, the drug scene of the 1970s, early 80s, New York City, um, which I was getting involved in with a whole crew that I was running with in, in middle school, junior high school, which wow. is still hard for me to wrap my head around when I had, you know, especially when my kids were young. I was like, wow, I was doing shit I shouldn't have been doing at 13, you know? So the thing that's bizarre I- is when I looked at my middle school scene, if you look at some of those people now, it w- it's like Liev Schreiber, Adam Harvitz from the Beastie Boys. Like we were all in, ran together in the same school at IS-70, which we all somehow ended up in the arts in, in different ways. Dante Ross, who's a big A&R guy. I, I think Vin Diesel, I didn't know Vin, but he was in my middle school also, which is just weird. But anyway. Wow, and did you did you keep a track of each each of all of their careers? Did you? Uh, I mean, I did. I mean, goals? Liev Schreiber and I never really hung out after uh, Adam Harvitz. We hung out a bunch through high school, and then we lost track after. You know, we used to watch the Beastie Boys just in the beginning when they just sucked, <laughs> and we would we would laugh as they got booed off stage, and they were pretty shocked that they were even starting to that their career was start. They were learning their instruments as they were going. It was just yep. a, and we'd go and like. Oh my God! The Beastie Boys are gonna play the Cat Club, and they get booed off stage. And um, <laughs> you know, it's just they stuck with it and captured a scene. But no, I lost. I lost. I mean, I haven't spoken to Adam in I hate to say forty years. I mean, it's been a long time. You know. Right. Wow. So, so as you as it came to as you came to an age where you were actually started going to to clubs while you're still living in New York, did you ever spend much time in the original Knitting Factory venue? Um, I didn't. I, even though I grew up in the area as well. I mean, I was really, I had spent time, it's funny, it, it's weird when you look back at it that I ended up at Knitting Factory when most of my time when I went to meet, when I went to clubs was like CBGB's, you know, Wetlands Later area, which was the Disco Age, uh, Cat Club, Palladium. But I didn't step foot in the House and Street Knitting Factory. I didn't even get into the Knitting Factory Manhattan until after I'd already moved to Los Angeles and then years later got with the company that I came back and, and I grew up four blocks from Knitting Factory in Manhattan. I guess sometimes, right, when you grow up in places, you're not always paying attention to what's right in your area. I mean, it, it and I wasn't heavy into music until I got older. I, mean, I was heavy into listening to records, but not necessarily going to clubs. And like you said, at that point, I was very, I got myopically focused on on becoming an actor for a while, so it was right. it was a different thing. Okay, but you did, from what I understand, you you did, whenever you started working, you were working in bars and you did a lot of things from from whether it be security or working behind the bar or managing the kitchen. When you actually started working for, when you moved out to California and started working for Knitting Factory Hollywood in two thousand, even with that experience that you had. Like, what were some of the biggest learnings about venue management once you actually started? Well, I, yeah, I, I came out of college and then I started pursuing acting immediately. I was like, okay, what do I want to do? I was, I was going to go to law school if you had that little piece. And then I decided mm-hmm. I wasn't really sure I wanted to go to law school. I might as well pursue this acting thing. I might as well grab a bar job because I know what the game is. And I grabbed a bar job. And then I got very lucky acting out the gate. Somehow my father was even shocked. Like I just started to get one (laughs) TV show after another. The bar job became secondary. And I was like 22 making all this money on commercials and episodic TV shows and movies of the week. And I was like, oh, this is easy. I decided to go to LA and then it got hard. I think once it became a real thing and a job for me, the, the stress levels of trying to be an actor became harder. You know, the, the auditions became important. So the, they didn't mean anything to me. At that point, I was still, I never, because I grew up in an acting household or to call it an arts household, I always knew to hold your day job, you know, or night job. So I would just, I just started to work in bars and restaurants. And I would say learning curve wise, like I said, I've worked in New York in bars and bars and venues for years, m- more nightclubs. Came to L.A., started working in Luna Park in West Hollywood, which was like a three-room music venue, comedy club, and nightclub and restaurant. And at that point, I was the bar manager. I became the bar manager there. I've always been very good, luckily very good at math and very good at 
I shouldn't say very good at math, but good enough that I could run numbers <laughs> in my head quickly, good at multitasking and good with people. So I started to move up in that. And then my manager, GM there, went to Knitting Factory Hollywood. They had just come here. They'd been open like a month. And he called me up, Anthony, his name was Anthony, called me up and said, it's a disaster here. <laughs> Can you help me organize? And I said, well, what do you want me to organize specifically? Because I need help on the bars and I need help operations. And I said, I said, okay, I'll, you know, I left that Luna Park was closing. It kind of worked out. I jumped to the Knitting Factory Hollywood. I just immediately, you know, I guess we're all good at certain things. I just started to identify where the issues that they were have, having immediately, both operations, bar side, cost of goods. And that was my first learning of music venue, bar operations, restaurant. And we had three rooms running simultaneously, 60 cap, 100 cap, 600 cap, all running different scenarios. So it was hands on, Rod. You couldn't be a like, oh, that's not my job. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, you were you were deep in everything. And that was my first that's where I started to learn. And uh, I wouldn't say the learning curve was that hard for me because I'd already been at Luna Park yeah. and I had watched how we dealt with that. As you ask me questions, I'll get deeper into sure. it. But that was really my first foray into call it organized chaos as the cliche goes, you know. Right. I read a quote from you where you said, uh, whenever you land at a knitting factory venue, it doesn't matter what the show is. You just know you're going to have an exciting, interesting experience. How would you define that knitting factory experience? Well, whether or not I, our company can deliver that, that's always my, uh, I would say, my, my pulpit, bang the drum way to be. Like I, Because I came so heavy from hospitality, to me, it's all hospitality, right? You know, you go to a high-end restaurant, right? If the service is bad, you don't care how good the food was. If you go to a restaurant and the food is just okay, but the service is incredible, you're coming back. And I've really worked with our teams around the country to the best of my ability in, in downstreaming it is that the experience needs to be top notch from the security at the front door to the host or hostess to the bar to the, then you get to the show. Cause you know, if you go to a show in Sydney, I mean, pick a venue and let's be frank, security is assholes. As you come in, you're already pissed off. Right. And then you go to the bar and now they're fucking assholes and you're pissed <laughs> off more. You're waiting for the drink. And now the show comes on and you're just irritated. But if you come in and security was cool and everybody was great and, and you come through a bar was they talk to you, they say hello, they acknowledge you. And if they're busy, the show comes on. So that's the experience I try to deliver. It's tough because it's a very transient job. Unless you build your security team isn't always the same guys or girls. The, the bar the same way and you could build this incredible team and then you get a shitty review and you're like, what happened? Well, we lost six of those people and we're trying to deliver it again. Mm. So your leaders at each one of your spaces need to have my mantra in their heads and then deliver that. And that's who we try to hire. I've done all those jobs. So I personally, when they say, oh, you know, I'm going to know you. When I had a meeting here a couple of years ago, one of our spaces, I said, everybody needs to do security. You got to step into those shoes and see what that job is like before you cast why they're reacting a certain way. And you'll see how hard it is and how many dealing with drunk people, irate people, you know, it's it, the gambit is so far and the different, you know, from a special event to the regular crowd to a hardcore show night, you got to have a very good even keel. That was one of the jobs that taught me the most, that and working the bar. I mean, honest to God, I mean, those yeah. jobs, patience, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that idea of making sure it's a good experience from the security to the bar to, to everything to do with the evening. Do you think audience expectations or customer expectations have changed over the years in terms of what they expect from a night out when they step into a venue? I think it's gotten absolutely more difficult to compete without being you know, a top-notch experience. I, I think that you can compete, but you're, if you're not staying at that level it will start to wane for your, for whoever you are and whatever you're doing. And it, and I think that iconic venues have probably can hold without doing that as much because they've been around a long time and people are just like, oh, and I don't mean that Troubadour is like, I'm going to use Troubadour as an example. Like mm. 
people are always going to go to the Troubadour in LA. They have it, like, even if the, it was a shitty experience, and I've never had a shitty experience at the Troubadour. Like, I just want to caveat that. I'm just using that as an example. Sure. But I don't think it matters as much for that venue because, but I know that in the venue business or the bar restaurant vi- business, because of the level of competition and the amount of venues that are now in markets, like tertiary markets are getting harder for me when we were the main go-to and now I've got three other competitors, one of them being Live Nation or AEG now that was never in my market and now they're here. And then I've got another independent that's here with me. The only way you're gonna compete is not only is the show have to be great, is that your venue experience, whether it be design, sound, lighting, the people, you have to try to keep that because people talk about it immediately. Yeah. So that, that puts uh, a lot of pressure, I guess, on the experience, which we've just spoken about, but also the bookings, presumably, and understanding what an audience wants and what your audience wants. Do you find that that's the case, that, that booking is, is perhaps more important than ever, getting that right? Look, we've always tried to get booking right. You know, it's, it, I, don't know if it's more, I don't know if it's more important it's always just been the same amount of importance. It's, it's, it's knowing how to book correctly in the market you're in and what shows will deliver. And what I've found is that it took, in these tertiary markets that we're in, like a Boise or Spokane, back when we were in those markets in 2007 and 08, you know, shows that would sell out in New York City that people knew, like a deer tick, uh, like bands like that, you know, you'd sell Irving Plaza in New York, sell out, 1,500 people. You get to Boise and a 50 people would show up, 100 people, because it wasn't ready. But now those markets are ready for that. They, they, they hear it. They see it. They watch it. They know it. And, and that's made it actually in a way easier for us to deliver really interesting things that before we couldn't, we were very, you know, we know uh, Ted Nugent's going to sell. I mean, you know what I mean? Like that, right. that that has changed you know i mean look in in every venue i'm sure the buyers would say the same thing you know it can't be the barometer of good or bad taste we got to deliver what will sell tickets mm-hmm. that doesn't mean when we're selling tickets we're trying we're we're still trying to bring what we believe is the best show possible that doesn't mean that i'm not going to do shrek rave or <laughs> bubble rave or <laughs> or something that's just bizarre. And, and look, if people are having a good time, the Taylor Swift's, all those, I don't mean Taylor Swift in like the arena, but I mean the Taylor Swift dance nights. Yeah. I mean, that stuff is, it makes people happy. They're dancing at night. They're having a good time. They want to go to it. I can see my buyers sometimes going, I had an argument with my buyers last year over Shrek rave. They're like, oh, we can't put this in. I'm like, book the show. <laughs> They're like, are you going to take the blame? I go, I go, of course. I go, well, I run the, I mean, I, you want me to take the blame? I said, if I take the blame, for, if, it, if it tanks, then I'm taking the accolades when you guys remember you're going to have to honor that you didn't want to fucking do this. Excuse my, I, excuse my language on this. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and, and then when it blew up and we did a thousand people, they were, they were like, they had to admit that I was right. So I laughed. I go, I, go, I told you it was going to be a hook. It's just a, it's a, it's so weird that it was going to sell out. You know, I don't know. Well, it's interesting because I was going to ask you what what kind of events are selling tickets these days, and it's a very it's a very general question. But I have seen when I look at venue listings, you'll see the Taylor Swift night, you'll see the emo night, you'll see tribute acts, uh, and of course, you'll also see original acts coming through as well. What trends are you seeing in terms of what is consistently selling tickets, whether it's genre or whether it is those those I guess more unusual nights? It's, uh, it's, a, it's such a hard question to answer. Those theme dance nights, call them, they are doing very well. Like the reggaeton is doing extremely well. The, those, you know, DJ nights with these themes, will it continue? I don't know. But they are carrying where we're doing a couple of those a night where we know, like, guaranteed in X clubs, we do these nights where we know that this is the dollar value we're going to get. In terms of what shows are selling, it depends on the market. I always know that, you know, alternative country and country up in these other markets where they're going to sell out immediately. It's hard drinking, sell out crowd. Um, DJ nights do really well. Um, you know, back in New York, it's just, it's a mixture. I mean, it's just so different. Sure. If I look at my, like a listing of shows of what's sold out, they're just across the board. It's not like outdoor amphitheater shows are very 
you know, like when I just brought up like like a, like a Shaky Graves and Avid Brothers and uh, Aaron Lewis and sellouts, Zach Brown Band sellouts. Though I know those are always selling out. Yeah, you start getting a little too cool. <laughs> you know, they that doesn't seem to translate as well as. By the way, I was um, you know, when I do our smaller venues, I'm like, man, these fish cover bands are just <laughs> crushing. Like, what is up? <laughs> Bar drinking hard, we'll put in this like Echo Park, you know, Silver Lake band, and eighty people will show up. Fish cover band, three hundred. I don't, I <laughs> right. don't know. Yeah. So, well, what about? Yeah. I mean, again, this this may be too broad a question, but in terms of what you're seeing from ticket buying behavior, for a while now there has been that that I guess trend that people are buying late. Um, what, are you seeing any consistent trends in ticket buying, uh, perhaps across your, your smaller venues as opposed to the amphitheaters? Um, oh, the sm- yeah, smaller venues, 100% buying late. Like you right. can't look at, especially if you look at our really small ones, like the 300 caps. Like the other night I saw a show, it was like a in advance 15 sold. Like, oh, wow. Night of show, 220. Right. I'm a lot of that, a lot. It seems like unless it's a like an underplay or something really hot, then that's selling out. But all the rest, the buyers seem to be like, okay, we're going to go late. Um, buyers on the amphitheater side are also, even though they're selling quicker, they are going to the show later because they've sort of been trained in our other markets that it's too damn hot to get to that show, and we know we're still going to have a good eye line on the show. But I feel like they're buying a little bit later, and the consumption alcohol consumption's down a little bit and uh, i guess there's there's two questions about that a is for the when people are buying late uh, is there anything that you that you can do to try and mitigate that and secondly if the bar is down are there other ways that you are trying to uh, make up for that revenue that you're lost there yeah i mean you know marketing i always say you know the shows that need to be marketed really hard are usually the shows that aren't going to sell anyway i mean that's the that's the truth the ones that are like we just put up and they sell and that's always been the the, unfortunately you know you can you can try you what you don't want to do is if you start to train your call it your audience in your community wherever it may be that we're going to go on to discount they know that if if they sit back and they don't buy, we're going to discount. So you got to be careful. That's a fine line, right? You've probably heard that from other people. Like, if you're looking at going, God, maybe we should lower the price, lower the price. You do that too many times, they start going, I'm just going to sit here and wait because they're going to go from 30 bucks to 22 bucks. So that's a, that's a fine line carry. And then in terms of, you know, I hate to say, which is reality, is that, you know, the more the minimum wage moves up, the more that salaries move up, the more that rent moves up, the more that insurance moves up, um, we just have to we have to start pumping up drink prices. I mean, those are the only we have to give up more merch to the bands, bands and patrons. You know, we're like a microcosm. They look at us and they think, oh, the venue is making so much money, but we're not. Like it is a it is a very very thin margin business. So when you start taking away the merch from us, we start lowering our our ticketing fees. People aren't drinking as much. You're not getting as many shows, but everything else is moving up. You know, that's what I would dare somebody to just say, okay, why don't we take a venue, just a specific venue, and break it down for the month, what it costs per day to run, and how many shows we have, and what you think we're making. Because if I have a $10,000 guarantee, and the band is taking 90%, and I just made a grand, oh, they made a grand. Well, I also just give them 100% of the merch. And uh, those 1,000 people drank... 7,000 bucks. So you think I just made eight grand. But the reality is it cost me $3,000 to open the door that day. So I made five on that specific night. What about the other 28 nights? Do they all make five? Sometimes. Chances are if you're making 5% net revenue on your venue at this point, you're very lucky. And that's the truth. And that's where it's there's always the battle of how much more can we give up? I mean, a lot of times we're giving up 100% of the door to an artist, hmm. you know? And then, so think about that. You give 100% of the door, and now everybody's drinking less, and now you don't get a piece of the merch. Where do you, I mean, I'd love to be, you know, Elon Musk, but we're, <laughs> or Live Nation, you know, I can't, I don't have the sponsorship. I'm an independent company. I can't survive on that, you know? 
and so putting up drink prices is is one thing that you mentioned there and food drink you know i mean and merch is that you did mention merch so do you do you if it's our taking... merch yeah if it's our merchandise sure but the band dictate their own merch price so right. so back in the day it used to be you used to get you know 60 40 70 30 80 20 90 10 now a lot of it's 100 percent to the artist so there's not really a a grip on that we're not even taking that you know a piece of that problem is the ticketing fees go up for you as a patron you know why am i paying that you know twenty dollar ticketing fee on that eighty dollar ticket that's a big ticket but well you're paying it because that's the only place the venue's making money nobody wants everybody wants to blame the ticket masters and blame and nobody wants to talk about well the venues are taking a piece of that ticket we are we all are Sure. You have to. I can't speak for Europe and Australia. It's a different setup. But in the U.S., when there's a f- ticket fee, it's because usually that's the only place or the, the the one spot that we are taking in some dollars to cover our overhead. I'd rather right. not set a high ticket price fee. Really wouldn't. Well, then give me a lower band fee. Nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> that's true. Well, how how do you see this playing out? How do you do you forecast for the next? Two, three, five years? We can't. I can't forecast that far out. You know what I mean? It's just too. It's it's too. It is too far. We try to do our best. You know, a year out, going. You know, and even that's hard, right? So many, so many factors. Weather. I know pandemic was an anomaly. Hopefully, you know, you just compete to the best of your ability, and you try to. You know, people always ask what what makes an independent competitive, and I and I say speed to the market, speed to market, and I would tell any new buyer or new somebody new in the industry our talent buyers in our company if you as agent call us and say hey i have um tame impala i mean that's a massive one there's one for you there's a band there's a tame there's an australian right sure. um tame impala is coming through i need these dates held we have to answer this quickly boom if we if we drag they're going to the next venue so my buyers i call them they're a bit crazy they are answering very fast and giving offers in very fast and we beat other competitive offers expediently and they know that if they're coming through to a knitting factory that the experience for them for that artist is going to be fantastic we will take they know that oh they're gonna oh, i want them to feel like oh i got off the road and it's been brutal oh you got showers you got laundry you got a green room hospitality is great staff is awesome we will be back and that's huge yeah how far in advance do you find the bookings are coming through now? That is the one further and further. I mean, we started booking, like we have a festival we're going to start hopefully booking for now, for next October. And a lot of the festivals are already confirming for next year, end of next year. Like those big, especially the big artists, you know, Chili Peppers, for example, that's a massive one, but, you know, they just announced their next year's world tour. Like those are... Mm-hmm. Because we have some we have some support artists on that in our management division, um, and I was like, "When is that show?" And it was like July. I was like, "Oh wow, you're you're." I mean, I got two dates in July with Chili Peppers, awesome. But they, we're freaking in December, so yeah, they they're uh, they're 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 coming. We are booking way way far out, more than ever. You, you mentioned their your management. Uh, you mentioned festivals as well. Um, I know you also have a record label. There's restaurants as well, so. It's quite a diverse portfolio under the Knitting Factory Entertainment banner. Um, I guess beyond diversifying, and there's perhaps an element of security that comes with not putting all of your eggs in one basket, but are there other sort of key benefits to having a portfolio that wide? Do they each interconnect and help the other? Great question. Well, it, it is a double-edged sword in that. Maybe if I could go back in time, I wouldn't be as diversified, you know, because I... It, it, it takes your focus away from sometimes I wish that I had just built more and more music venues and larger scale up than, than getting into hospitality, you know, cause hospitality, we got slammed in. I mean, I've closed seven bars and restaurants. This will be the seventh in the last two and a half years because now three are ours. One was a split on a management fee and three was a partners that we just invested in, but the pandemic just whacked our, I mean, we opened three space, four places that Jan, Feb, March of, what was it, 21 pandemic or 20? I can't even remember, 2020. So those, imagine opening up your doors, you know, that was, so 
they never survived. And then some of the ones that I've had over the years, like this federal bar I'm working out of, um, I'm closing December 31st. I had a 10 year incredible run and the last two have been rough. So that's the negative. The diversified side is I have a lot of other things that are cranking. You know what I mean? Like the venues are fantastic. The record label, which you probably even know, which is Partisan Records, because we, we have yeah. a bunch of Australian, I think Maple Glider may be Australian, but there's a, you know, you know, bands that are like Fontaine's DC and, and uh, in terms of like the UK and, and Idols, Idols and Black Angel. Yeah, I mean, PJ Harvey. And um, I'm not saying those are all. So the label's been on a massive upward swing and it took us a decade to get there. I mean, the two founders I met when, shit, when I was a, a GM and one was working box office in the Knitting Factory, Manhattan, and the other was a friend. That was partisan and that was... Uh, Deer Tick. I mean, that, that's why I brought them up. That was their first band, and they were like, hey, do you want to get involved in this? I was like, yeah, let's let's go do this, and then we just picked up the Fela catalog. I need your help on that. So, yeah, some things intertwine really well, some don't. I mean, there is, there is, you know, it doesn't always work. In, in your brain, you think, oh, you got the label, and you got a venue, and you got a manager, and you're managed. Doesn't mean you have all three working in conjunction. Sometimes you're like, I have the artists on the label playing my venue and we manage them. But 90% of the time, it's more like, God damn it, why'd that artist that we manage go play a different venue than ours? Right. Because the agent or, man, or agent may dictate that, hey, we love Knitting Factory, but now we want to play. We can't just play your, you know, they want to. So it's, it doesn't always work that way or it's a different capacity. Yeah. Um, and then there are artists that don't want to be like in a 360 deal. You know, so I, and it's like, we don't force that. We're like, look, we, we have publishing also. So in my brain, I always wanted it to work that way. Like, you know, it's hard to even get your different teams to talk to one another. Like label right. going, hey, label, do you know that if you need artists A&R wise, my talent buyers who are booking are getting the baby bands from the agencies before anybody sees them. So you should be talking to each other. Oh, yeah, yeah, we need to do that. And I'm like, but you don't. <laughs> you know, like I could force feed you. Like, why don't you sit like, hey, set up a monthly call to talk yeah. about. So, yeah, it's a, you know, you learn, look, I've been in, in, at this 30 years and with this company 20. And if I could go back in time, there'd be some changes that I would make that weren't, you know, there's yeah. some things that work brilliantly and some things you get your ass kicked. It's the nature of what it, what it is. And I didn't, you know, I learned, you know, I came out of college, I didn't go to like Wharton Business School. I learned on the ground in the industry. And, mm -hmm. you know, my learning curve took a while to figure, I had to figure it out. I guess another question about interconnectedness, uh, not so much across the range of your portfolio, but more within the actual venue side of things. So I think there's four knitting factory venues um, across the States at the moment. In terms of using data, and using intelligence from each venue to inform what the other venue might do. do is, is there much data sharing that goes on? That yeah, that, that part, I wouldn't say it's, yeah, it's not so much data sharing, like what is your spending patterns? Like I'm not, that's not, I mean, I'm not Spotify. We don't really look at it that way. We're more looking at it. It's more about the talent buying. There's, you know, the group of talent buyers are together. And because yes, we have ones that we, which are brick and mortar, we are, owning but then we also buy from multiple venues around the country in different markets at different capacities that we're like a white label like slow down omaha elevation 27 virginia beach hop springs murfreesboro tennessee we're about to start booking for one other and then there's one more i think uh, the myth in minneapolis so all the buyers are talking amongst each other and we're also trying to block buy and we're also trying to use that data you know from Okay, how did it do in this location last time to how did it do in this location? You know, we have our own internal booking system that we capture a lot more information than I think a lot of people do. Like I can go back 15 years and pull up what a show did in a venue and what the bar per caps were. Right. Like those are things that people don't always have because we, when we're running your own, I can see what you drank per head. But it's also difficult because trends change. Like if you just go back and you even pull Polestar, you look and you go... Oh man, that band, you know, was only doing 2,000 people. Now we want to put them in the amphitheater. Like, whoa, wait a minute. That is true that three years ago they did. But now they're, they're number five on the radio spins and they have 15 million people. So let's not, 
you can't overanalyze some of that stuff, right? That's sure. the, yeah. But we definitely, look, it's an internal, you know, there's a weekly buyer call. And then my buyers are also on calls with other buyers around the country to talk, you know, what's, what's trending, what's not, what's breaking, what's not, you know what I mean? All that shit, so. Okay. What, what about customer data? Like, do, do you have customer data from each of your venues as well? And is that something that I, you use as a, a marketing tool then to be able to reach these people directly? Yeah, I think we could probably be better at it, but we're not a big data like grab like, you know, hey, Rado, you went to Knitting Factory, then you went to Macy's, you know, it's not <laughs> not tracking. Um, we It's more genre based than anything else. Like we'll look at, you know, Death Cab for Cutie played and now um, we have a band and that's in that genre. So when we go to market, we're going to hit that list of Death Cab and then all the bands geographically where people bought. So both genre and ge- geo like okay we had new york's you know such let's not use new york but let's use a uh i'll use boise again so we'll you know we'll go, go okay we had 50 percent of our audience bought from boise proper 20 bought from meridian 20 bought came from out of state um so we'll try to hit those lists and people can opt out by the way when they're buying a ticket you can opt out so you only get so we genre base and geo base and try to market into and rate, and then we hit the radio station specifically to that. But it's, I'll be frank, I always say we, should, we could be better at it. I'd love to be like Amazon where the SEO is so, when I'm scared to even say Amazon, that means they're going to try to sell me something on my phone right now, right? Like, did I, I just looked at like a car and I've got these Amazon car ads, right? We all go, what the, f-? right? So, yeah. Um, do you, do you, with, with those lists that you mentioned and, and that targeting, do you get a sense of, where most of the tickets come from, whether it's social media targeting or whether it's just email list targeting. Do you have an idea what's the most effective channel? Yeah, so, I mean, it, we, by the way, back in the day, Knitting Factory Hollywood, in 2002 or three, it might be 04, I, we were one of the first venues to pull our newspaper LA Weekly advertising. And I did it. I, I actually, I'll take the credit on that one for our venue. I did it because I started to do general polls at the box office back then. I was like, why don't you just ask people when they come up, just do a, do a, do a line slash for me of where. And I found that 95% were either getting it. On, at that point, it was uh, MySpace. And I uh, got to go back. And it was, um, it was banned websites is where... Not MySpace anymore. Um, right. People aren't going there, but it's social socials and the band socials. It's fo- it's that's really more than e blasts are. You know, they, we do them, they open them, but there isn't. It's social and it's amazing. I'm still blown away that Facebook is so. I I'm be like, oh, it's only my even my own kids are in their twenties. Oh, it's only you. I go, no, no, sons. That's it's not. Yeah, like we put up all these shows and we're looking at the data and it's not like. 45 and above is buying those tickets. The 20 somethings are still tracking. So we do a lot of Facebook advertising, Instagram, TikTok, you know, all the, you know, that's the click through ratio. And then, like I said, bands are their best. You always want a band to talk the show. You know, yeah. That, that's number one. That, that's the primary. Like they're, you know, hey, I'm playing Knitting Factory North Hollywood next week. And that's the jump. Absolutely. When you, when you think about some of the venues or when you're looking at opening up a new space or you're looking at a, at a venue to start working with, like what's at the top of your due diligence list before you decide to, yep, yeah, we're going to open a venue in this space? You know, number one is trying to tap an untapped market. Geographically, if it, you know, first, does it fit into what we already have? I mean, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it can be, you know, I was just looking at a market that had nothing to do with the markets we were in. But it's really like, okay, before the big guys get there, you know, we've done that a lot where we build the market and then they come and kick our ass and then we've got now competing. And that, that's been the tiring part of my business where it's like, I didn't sell and now they're planting flags in the, you know, I was never competing with Live Nation in Montana and now I am. Or somebody sees that we've controlled that market for 15 years and now they want to build a venue and they have more money than we do and they build the bigger venue and the bigger, you know, so that's the... Those are the negative hard parts, but the positive is looking at the routes that haven't been tapped necessarily and also to do our best to not jump in and do what I just said I don't want to have happen. Like I just looked at a market and I went, you know, if we pop in here, 
we're automatically competing with two other venues at our capacity and we can't even lie like we're not oh well, let's be friends we're, we're competing with you sure. we're here to compete with you and i'm like let's don't need to i'm not let me be clear i'm not that altruistic that i wouldn't do it if i really felt like i have to have this and this is i'm gonna go head to head because it happens to me it's that's our the nature but it's really those are the first things we look at and go okay can we route it? Is anybody here yet? What's the capacity? What's the you know population like? Is it growing? What are the I know the simple things that you know, what are the throughways? Is it the ten, the seventy, the the ninety, the so those are the all the you know, what are the demographics uh, you know, uh, financially of the community? Like can mm-hmm. can they bear us dropping millions of dollars into you know, and what is the city like that wants to some cities are great and some are not. So we have to look at all those factors. And there's markets which we've jumped into that we thought we had them all and we were wrong. And there's markets that, I've, that I should have gone into that we did, it, you know? It's, it's so fascinating that all those things that, that, that you take into account, and of course it all makes sense. The idea of you setting yeah. up somewhere and then uh, I guess you know, a big player coming in and all of a sudden you have to compete with them. How do you try and build loyalty amongst your audience before those big players come in? Are there things like membership programs that you do? Is there, are there any techniques that you that you do to we try have and those? But I I hate to say that that is the world has changed. Like it doesn't. I mean, I'm being. I, I guess I'm being um, negative in my response to back in the day, controlling history, building all that all made the biggest difference. Now you'll read about, oh my God, I, I can't believe it's this, they're coming in. Then the show goes on sale, nobody, they're going to the show. Right. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't, they just came in and trounced you, they're going to the show. Yeah. Um, that That is, like I said, it kind of comes back to the experience. You try to, like we just did, you know, we knew that we helped build the Boise market when we bought out the Big Easy back in 07, 06, and we converted to Knitting Factory, it took us five years to make that market where we took losses. If I could go back in time, I would have built, you know, 10,000 cap amphitheater and a 2,000 cap room, but that would have been dangerous then because none of the market wasn't built yet. It took us a long time to, to build these markets, you know. We built in Missoula, Montana, and then somebody drops a huge amount of money and they build their own Taj Mahal amphitheater. And now we're the secondary play. But we built the market. So, you know, it's... And it's not like the fans don't love our shows when we have them, but they've got the better shows. You know, so it's... I think loyalty, you hope that your relationships with agents, and it does help a lot, and managers, when you're buying the show, will remember that history and give you the show. And a lot of times you can win it because we have those relationships. But a lot of times the win is about the dollar. <laughs> like, yeah, we love you, but, you know, bring that offer up 75%. You know, <laughs> so it's, it's um, I've just, I just know now that when I go into a market, I will do everything to, f- to see into the future of how I'm going to trap that and not let them trounce me. Or their only other play is going to be, they're going to have to buy me. And at that point, I may now consider going, you know what? I've seen the future. Maybe I have to sell or co-pro with them right. because they're going to come in anyway. That's where it gets hard. Yeah. I mean, it must be incredibly hard for an independent venue owner who has one venue. You know, at least I guess you have a portfolio of venues. Do you encounter venue owners who, who have one venue and then don't have, I guess, the, the strength in numbers to actually compete? All over the country, I mean, people probably don't recognize the amount of venues that have closed all over, probably all over the world at this point, because they are getting stepped on and they can't compete anymore. And like I said, it's not, I think I was clear, it's not just competition, it's the costs. Hmm. It's the, it's the excel, accelerated cost, the lack of inventory, and then that added piece of, uh, the, you know, the, 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 I mean, I'm booking, we've got a venue in Minneapolis right now. Um, a 3,000 cab venue. We're the buyer. Love the owner. I mean, the competitive nature of Minneapolis now is, obs- you know, you have the, the great independents who have been there, like First Ave and Dana. She's fantastic. But then you have, you know, the, the major players that are in there. And the only way we even grab shows is that 
we have really good relationships and we keep our we can keep our expenses down on this one specifically so we can get some but you know we'll probably do 25 shows next year where some of those venues will do 25 in a month and a half so i mean it's a very i always tell friends of mine or even colleagues or people in consulting you know not to be jaded but they want to get into this business and i go okay you better have a lot of capital and you better be willing to weather the storm and you better have somebody that knows what they're doing in order to compete. Shifting the conversation slightly to the festival space that you've been yeah. involved in, uh, you know, looking at a festival like Desert Days, for example, um, which is, has been successful. I mean, what, what do you think were some of the key steps you took to set that festival up for success or to really set any new festival that you're involved with up for success? Well, Desert Days, that one specifically, I mean, it's been, it's been a, a critical success, not a financial success. So let's be, let me be clear. So it takes, again, it's one of those things that uh, met the founder, Phil Perrone, and I saw that his vision was in, aligned with what we felt in the music space. And I saw that his, his space, you know, he needed a team behind him and capital behind him to go and build this festival. And that, that's really... You know, we took a gamble, you know, and we had a couple of great years and then we had some tough years with weather and location moves. And then, you know, we held off last year. You know, we were like, look, we need another partner to come in and and help financially back this because we're an independent. I believe, you know, my company, they may think I'm crazy, but I believe in this brand and I believe that in Phil and his vision to take Desert Days to the next level of artists. And we've done incredible. I mean, I'm. I'm always blown away by just the curation that he puts together. And we help with that, but it's really his brain on that. And we work to back him up. Again, it's, I hate to say again, it's a very capital intensive. I mean, people don't realize that Coachella lost money for millions and millions. Mm. Bottle, every festival, it just takes a long, again, back to what I said before is it just takes a long time to build a market, build loyalty. And then you're, and then the cost of bands for festivals are astronomical now and that's the hard part too right different than it used to be you 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 know a band that i'm like wait we paid 10 grand for that band in the club now they're at the fest and they want 50 like you drew 600 people <laughs> you know <laughs> but you want the name so it that is that is the tough part of the festival business but if you believe in the brand and you believe in the the experience and the value that it's bringing then you you know you do your best to you know, but I don't want to put my company under either. Like I, I, I can only carry for so long. So like right now we're looking for, you know, we're not looking. We have a possibly other partner to help us for 24 with DD. And we're in the middle of dealing with those contracts. And uh, hopefully we'll launch in 24 with a new partner. And that's the thing. We don't want to get behind the eight ball and buying talent. And that's the key right now. Like we need to be putting offers in now. If you put an offer in and then it's confirmed and then you don't do it, not like you don't have to pay. Sure. Last couple of things, Morgan. I was just wondering about yeah, um, technology and how, what sort of positive things technology has brought to your businesses, whether it's in the amphitheater or some of the smaller knitting factory cap venues. I mean, I, I see things, you know, information on RFID. I see QR codes. I see various yeah. ticketing uh, innovations that have happened, which have made the process of ingress easier. Are there any particular yeah. innovations that, that have really impacted the way positively that impacted the way that you, your venues operate? You only want, you only want the positives. So no, do you know what? Give it <laughs> no. to me all. <laughs> no, 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 no. Like if, if you're talking like festivals, the positive is, is, you know, like you just said, the RFID is, is great when you can do it because you're, you're get, not only are you getting people in very quickly, you're gathering information and then they can also their experiences, they load up that RFID and then they go in and they're hitting the bars, they're hitting food, they're hitting, they're getting merch and they can keep it all loaded and it's just one piece. Um, we've also got a lot of places where we're going cashless bars. So it, there's both the ease in which, you know, it used to be like, I mean, I literally two years ago, I was at the bank myself in Riverside and I'm picking up like 30,000 in cash in a backpack and I'm throwing it in my truck and driving out to the venue and being like, okay, where are we putting, stuffing it in my RV, right? I mean, that's the, that is the realities of, of the dangers of carrying all that cash. So some of these things are just, makes it life easier. 
Um, it gets tough when you have Wi-Fi problems. That is the, and then you have to go into, you know, offline mode and hope that, you know, you can still run, but then hope later when you go back in that you don't have a lot of fraud. So I think, you know, having, having um, Starlink, so having like Starlink and RFIDs and then, you know, uh, mobile, you know, that's been the change in the world, you know, way back when we were like, are people really going to buy tickets on mobile? Yeah, you got to have, you know, very dynamic websites and ticketing platforms that they can, you can pick up this phone and your website can now be dynamically changed to here and you can see everything in order. So those have been, that's been great. That's made life, you know, uh, I, I think a lot easier. And then tech, you know, just in the sphere of dealing with socials and mm-hmm. putting out messaging to people. And, you know, that's the other thing with, with having apps at shows or festivals that you can put out like, Hey, during the third song, we got a Jack Daniels promo going down here. And it makes it better for sponsorship because sponsorship wants all those bells and whistles. So those are all the, the pieces. But again, I mean, I've had it where it's, you know, we had a big issue two years ago at DD where, you know, we had uh, one of the big sponsors. Their whole world was Wi-Fi and we didn't and the Wi-Fi was crashing. Right. And the sponsor was pissed off. And I was like. That's a, that's, a, you know, problematic. Um, that's the top of my head on tech, you know, show sure. in terms of like sound lights, you know, video walls, all that stuff, the bells and whistles or, yeah. you know, uh, security flows in, in, in having, you know, I don't know if that world has changed much because you still, when I mean, you're still wanding people, you're still putting people through metal detectors, you're still juggling that. We could probably spend hours on the safety of patrons and, and, uh, active shooters and, that's a whole other piece of the world. You know? Sure. Very last thing, Morgan, in terms of, I mean, across the breadth of your career, and you must have seen some incredible performances from artists, whether they were artists that meant something to you growing up or, or just artists, I don't know, that, that impacted your life in some other way. Are there any kind of magical performances or magical experiences that you've had in your venues? Just, just pick one. So many that were you know, where you sit there and you're like, this is why I do this. I mean, as a kid, I would say the experience of seeing Jeff Beck live at the Palladium when I was a teenager. Right. Seeing Talking Heads in in Central Park. I mean, there are some of those where it's just, you know, those are the, those are like the impact. Walking in, I, I've told this one, walking into the Butthole Surfers at CBGB's, like skateboarding down the block at 13, <laughs> like a Rat Pack and going, seeing a, you know, a sandwich board that said butthole surfers and be like, what the hell? And walking in and being blown away by that. Um, watching Flea and Jean Frusciante jam at the old knitting factory Hollywood when I'd walk into our tiny 60 cap room and they were just jamming because they were about to do a world tour and the talent buyer was friends with with Jean Frusciante. So he would, and I would just sit in the back like this and be like, I'm watching Flea and Jean Frusciante jam. Wow. Desert days, like... You know, the Tame Impala show, you know, just after having a year where we had to evacuate because of a storm where they played one song and then coming back and then watching 15,000 people just exhort, you know, just, you know, the frenzy was amazing. And then, you know, Iggy Pop, I was side stage during Iggy Pop Desert Days uh, about six years ago. And just me and Phil looking at each other, pinching ourselves, going, is this really happening? Like, just standing there so yeah stuff like that gets me you know as jaded as i am where i'm like it reminds me why you know i do it and what the you know i just want people to i mean i'm probably overly conscious of people having a good time like i really really want people to have a good time and that's because it's the it's the let loose factor we deal with our day-to-day shit sure and what does it really do i'll leave you with one thing on that okay you bear with me because my father Sorry. My dad, my dad died uh, four months ago. Mm. Um, I'm sorry. So hang on. I'm just, uh, didn't mean to get emotional. It, you know, it'll hit you out of the blue. So, sure. so uh, after 9-11, because I grew up down there, um, my dad said something to me, which always I'll never forget, because it keyed into to kind of what our business is and why we do it, is he was walking... He lived in Tribeca. My mom is still there. And they had blocked off, you know, he could barely get in to his neighborhood because they had blocked it all off. 
And uh, he was trying to come through. And then all the cops recognized him from Scarface and Ace Ventura and all these other things. And and he was like, hey, he goes, I'm, I'm, no, I'm just an actor. This is not, I'm, it's meaningless what I do. It doesn't, like, you guys are the heroes. And then the, the, uh, the captain actually grabbed him and brought him to the side and said, hey, he goes, Mark, stop that. Like, you're the one moment of joy that these people have had in this tragic terrorist. They, they, you've just taken them out of that. So I try to always remember that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing Sorry for that. getting emotional. It's just, it's like it's four months. It's still raw. No, I appreciate I, I, it that. Doesn't usually, it doesn't usually hit me. Yeah. So it kind of slapped me a little bit. I apologize. Not at all. Um, thank you for sharing that, Morgan. But, that's, that's a lovely but note that's on, the, on which uh, to end. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on the rough note to end. Um, Morgan, thank you so much for your time and for sharing all, all of those insights and experiences. I, I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Sorry if I rattle a bit once we start getting into these things. I'm sure everybody in this industry, this Not long at all. Probably starts. Not at all. 